Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Royal Society and to this evening's uh, discussion. My name is David Reed. I'm a vice president of the Royal Society and the biological secretary. I have, <laughs> apart from keeping order in a general sense, uh, I have one uh, other important duty concerning your behaviour with mobile phones. If you should have brought a mobile phone in with you, would you please check it now to make sure that it's switched off? Thank you. This evening's event has been organised jointly by the Royal Society and by the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm very pleased uh, that the chair of the Royal Society of Literature, Maggie Gee, is here with us uh, this evening. Nice to see you, Maggie. Thank you for coming. Um, the proceedings will actually be managed by Professor Uta Frith. Uta was Deputy Director of the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in University College London from 1998 to 2006 and leader of the developmental group there. She continues her work as part of this group as Emeritus Professor in Cognitive Development. Uta originally studied experimental psychology in Saarbrücken and subsequently trained in clinical psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry in the University of London. Her book, Autism, Explaining the Enigma, has been translated into ten languages. She was one of the initiators of the study of Asperger's syndrome in the United Kingdom, where her work has been highly influential and of great importance. In the future, she tells us she will concentrate on topics in social, social cognitive neuroscience. Professor Frith is a fellow of the British Academy, of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and of our own uh, Royal Society. And uh, personally, it gives me great pleasure to see her here, because we, we've worked together, uh, Uta and I, on many of the Society's most important uh, uh, committees. And I can certainly say that in my experience, I have never known her to behave badly. <laughs> there can always be exceptions to rule of, rules, of course. I, I don't expect this evening to be one. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present Professor Uta Frith. Uta. So tonight it is time to behave badly. And we all know whether we feel guilty about this or not, we love watching horror and violence and aggressive movies and we, we like to read thrillers and novels and we can really indulge in all these feelings tonight, I think. I am very privileged in, in being able to chair such a distinguished panel and I'm also delighted that I can step into a tradition of joint meetings of the Royal Society of Literature and the Royal Society. It seems such a, um, an appropriate topic where people writing novels have thought so much about the mind of the um, murderer and where we also have some scientists who think about this to have a discussion together and to see what the really interesting questions are uh, tonight. And to start with, uh, each of the panelists will give a five-minute statement or so, and then you will all have your turn, and you can ask your questions. But first of all, I would like to introduce Professor Terry Moffitt. Terry Moffitt is a professor of social behaviour and development at the Institute of Psychiatry of um, the University of London. She has led major social, psychological and biological studies of human development. She's justly famous for her work on the Dunedin Health and Development Study where she followed up a large cohort of children into adulthood and where she made major discoveries about interaction of nature and nurture in the expression of violence and incidents of crime. She also leads a major twin study, again to identify the biological basis of um, aggressive, violent behaviour and conduct disorders. 
And in particular, I know she knows something about ASPOs and why adolescents are so prone to antisocial behaviour. Terry. Thank you, Yuta. It's lovely to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming out on a Monday evening. It's really an impressive audience. Uh, I'm just a simple psychologist, and as Yuta told you, what I do is longitudinal research. So I thought a good way to introduce this research is just to explain to you how it is that I go about carrying out these studies. We look into the early origins of individuals who develop antisocial behavior, and the point of doing this is to... Um, try to understand how early the very first signs of an antisocial lifestyle could be detected in a child, and therefore, uh, is there any opportunity for very early prevention um, early in the life course? So to show you how this research works, I'm just going to show you some photographs of one pair of children who have taken part uh, in one of my studies. This study takes place in New Zealand, in a town called Dunedin, uh, where we study 1,000 young people. They were all born in 1972 and 73. They're all the children born, all the babies born that year in that city. Um, uh, because they're all the children born in that city, it means that this cohort of 1,000 young people represents all walks of life, rich and poor, sick and well, loved and unfortunately unloved. Whenever they come into the um, research office uh, for data collection, you see here they come on their odd-numbered birthday. So we started at the moment with this little boy and girl when they were born. That's the point where they were enrolled in the study. And then we bring them back when they were age three and then at age five. Uh, each time they come, they stay for eight hours of data collection. So it's quite uh, an in-depth assessment. We study their family history of mental disorders and physical um, health, their own psychological health and behavior, their physical health, their social lives, their personality traits, biological measurements, cognitive tests, and we've also collected their DNA to look at genotypes. Uh, we not only interview the young people themselves and test them, uh, but we interview their parents, their teachers, their best friends. Now that they've gotten older, we interview their partners, and we look at their official records in the school system and the criminal courts. So here they are, this young boy and girl, when they, we saw them on their seventh birthday, their ninth birthday, and their eleventh birthday, their thirteenth birthday, you can see there's continuity in physiognomy, if not behavior. 15th birthday, 18th, 21st, 26th, and we most recently saw them when they were 32-year-olds in 2005. Uh, by now, these are the most in-depth studied 1,000 people in the world. 96% of them are still taking part uh, and took part in 2005. And of special relevance tonight, all of the criminal offenders are still taking part. Uh, and possibly that's because once you go into prison, it's very boring in there. There's really nothing to do. Uh, and it's quite exciting and interesting to have the variety uh, of taking part in research uh, while you're in prison. Now, you may be thinking that isn't New Zealand kind of a perfect uh, country and there's no violent behavior, no antisocial behavior there. We do have in the cohort a lot of people who have turned out to be sort of garden variety offenders, uh, drug dealers, thieves, wife beaters, that kind of thing. Uh, but we also have detected some young people who have by now a recidivist history of long-term violent and predatory offending. And we promise these young people complete confidentiality when we interview them about their crimes. And by now, the research team is privy to knowledge of some uh, criminal offenses that are unsolved by the New Zealand police. But we do keep their confidentiality, and we always will. Uh, we've identified a small group of individuals, mostly men, uh, who have by now done enormous damage to their society, uh, beginning as early as age three and continuing so far to age 32. So this is to give you an example of how you know, not everybody in New Zealand is nice and attractive. <laughs> okay. 
I wanted to also tell you about a newer study that we're, we're doing. We began this when I immigrated to Britain uh, about 11 years ago. Uh, this is basically a repeat of the study in New Zealand, but this time with twins. Uh, so we have 1,100 pairs of British twins. Uh, we selected them to overrepresent Britain's most adverse environments for child development. So these twins that we're studying now in Britain um, are growing up in Britain's poorest homes and uh, living in uh, Britain's most dangerous neighborhoods. We've assessed their development so far when they were born, and then at ages five, as you see here, uh, and age seven, age 10, and we're just finishing up the age 12 assessments right now. Now, uh, these kids look like little darlings when they're uh, five-year-olds, uh, but I wanted to show you that we do already have uh, twins by age, tw age 10 who were Britain's youngest recipients of an ASPO. So uh, just the, the final thing I wanted to say is that we have one finding from our research that has gotten quite a bit of attention, and that is that children who were maltreated early in life uh, are more likely to become violent as adults. Now, that's not news. Everybody knew this, and it's called the cycle of violence. Uh, but what was new about our research is that we found out that this cycle from an abused child to a violent adult depends in part on each child's genotype. Uh, we found, we discovered this in the study in New Zealand, but we've now replicated it here in the sample of British twins. The gene is called the MAOA gene, uh, and what we discovered is that the effect of this gene on a child's later behavior was completely silent unless the child was maltreated and then you could tell, detect the effect of the gene. Um, and this fits very nicely with what we learned from Matt Ridley's book, Nature Via Nurture, um, where he made the point that uh, our genes may most strongly affect our behavior through the way they make us vulnerable or resilient uh, to the aspects of our social environment that are the most important causes. So thanks. Thank you very much, Terry. That was a really a, a, a lightning tour through an enormous amount of research. And we now turn, a turn to John Banville. And I will show a picture. John Banville was born in Wexford in Ireland and was literary editor of the Irish Times from 1988 to 1999. Banville's fictional portrait of Copernicus won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize and was the first of a series of books exploring the lives of eminent scientists. And John Banville's 18th novel, The Sea, won the Man Booker Prize for 2005. But most relevant for this evening, um, John Banville wrote the Book of Evidence, which won the Guinness Pete Aviation Book Award, and the books Ghosts and Athena, which form a loose trilogy of novels narrated by Freddie Montgomery, a convicted murderer. So, John, can I provoke you with this painting, which is by Thomas Gainsborough, of course better known to us from his uh, marvellous portraits and landscape paintings. Now here, Gainsborough presents a deeply allegorical painting. We see two shepherd boys and one in the light, one in the shade, and two dogs fighting. Now you can probably see that one dog is lying there in a submissive posture which is supposed to induce the other dog to stop biting, to stop killing him, but it almost looks as if this other dog was not going to let go, was actually continuing and possibly viciously uh, bite his throat. Now, when you look at the boys, there is also some kind of fight going on because one of the boys seems to, um, to wish to restrain uh, the dogs and the other one restrains the other boy um, and even has a smile on his face. He wants to see what's happening in this terrible fight. So uh, critics uh, at the time um, who saw this painting for the first time were, were very, very moved, very impressed, and, and there was, were remarks along the lines of, of nature painting itself in this particular painting. And my question to you, John, is are human beings good or bad? 
<laughs> that's, a, that's a nice, simple question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for introducing me to the painting. I didn't know it. I wish Gainsborough had done more pictures like that. Um, curiously, I read it slightly differently to you. I see the boy with the stick as encouraging the fight and the smiling devil on his right-hand side is encouraging him. Uh, it does seem to me a picture about how much fun being bad is. Um, when I, I, I had forgotten the title of our, our colloquium tonight, and all the emails that I kept getting said, behaving badly on October 15th. And I thought, it was, I thought this is going to be fun because I thought this is what we were going to do. Um, if I were going to behave badly tonight, the first thing I would do is break open the glass case with the manuscript of Newton's Principia Mathematica, which is in the lobby of this building, and I would steal that, um, which is by way of saying how honored and, uh, and uh, frightened I feel at, at speaking in this place. Um, I don't think that human beings are bad or good. I think that most of human thought on our behavior is a series of misapprehensions. We, we misapprehend the fact that we think that, it, that at some point that we cease to be animals. We think that there is an absolute distinction between those two animals fighting on the ground and those two animals watching them. We think that they, the little boys, are some kind of gods and that the animals are animals. We forget always that we are animals. We're immensely... Uh, sophisticated and complicated, um, but we're still animals. It strikes me as astonishing that there isn't more murder and slaughter in the world. Uh, and I'm never surprised. When people say about the, let's say, t t pick one atrocity, the, 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 the Nazi murder of the Jews, they say, how could it happen? I'm always puzzled by this question because it's perfectly simple as to how it happened because people were given permission to behave extremely badly. Not only were they given permission, but they were encouraged because what the Nazis said is we, we must behave very badly for a certain number of years, then we will have cleared the world of the Jews and the communists, and a perfect world will come, and we, we can all live in this. This, of course, is entire misapprehension of the notion of progress that we feel, and I think it has something to do with the fact that we're born very young and we die quite old, and that we progress through life, and that therefore human life itself, you know, the, the, the mankind's journey through time is a progression toward some grand climactic. I don't believe that this is the case. And I think that if we went back, if we listened to our good philosophers such as Nietzsche and Emerson and people like that, we would, we would, we would retrace our steps and say, hang on, we've made an awful lot of mistakes along the way. Again, misapprehensions as to what we are and what we, how we behave and how we should behave. Um, this seems to me <laughs> self-evident, and the experts here can tell me how completely wrong I am. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, to hear that there is a gene that is only activated when children are treated badly. I would like to hear some more about that. That absolutely fascinates me. Plus, it gets the heat off me, right? <laughs> Thank you, John Banwell. Um, <clears throat> I think I can give a little preview. I, I know that James Blair later might actually have an example about what happens when you give permission to behave badly in one way and give permission to behave badly in another way, which might be quite an interesting answer to your question. But we next come to Faye Weldon. And I would also like to show a painting. Um, Faye Weldon read economics and psychology at uh, the University of St. Andrews. And I'm happy to say that she received an honorary doctorate from St. Andrews in uh, 1990. Her first novel, the Fat Woman's Joke was published in 1967, by which time she already had written some 50 plays for radio, stage, and TV. Faye Weldon is a former member of both the Arts Council Literary Panel and the Film and Video Panel of Greater London, London Arts. She was also chair of the judges for the Booker Prize. And uh, 
as many people know, Faye Weldon is famous for her prolific work in advertising. Now, much of Faye Weldon's fiction explores issues surrounding women's relationships with men and children and parents and each other. Um, for example, her novels, Praxis, or The Life and Loves of a She-Devil and Wicked Women, which won the Penn Macmillan Silver Pen Award. So, Faye, I want to provoke you, too, with this painting of Judith, who was celebrated for murdering the enemy king, Hall of Fairness. And this is a particularly gruesome painting, uh, painted by a woman painter, and it is said that she possibly painted this out of revenge for a rape that she experienced. So, Faye, did she enjoy doing it? <laughs> it's a fairly drastic painting, isn't it? Um, enjoy, I don't know, anger, yes, she felt obliged to do it. She, too, was given permission to hate, probably by other women, um, probably not by men. It, it is... It is a question. I, I mean, I feel the, the the worst side of the feminist movement in in the seventies was that it did give women permission to hate and despise men, and many of them took it. And though at the time there was some justification for it, I think men, on the whole, are not behaving nearly as badly as they used to. Uh, but but I may I may, I may be wrong. And and you know, it's, it's a sure way to get audiences really angry to say that kind of thing because. We, because being a victim is really such a wonderful and comfortable and cosy situation. Um, but look, I'm, 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 I'm not a scientist. I'm a writer. I'm a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy right-brain thinker and, and a sort of creative person, and I am surrounded by people who know what they're talking about, and I just I invent things. I write novels. Nevertheless, I did once write a novel called... Uh, called The Cloning of Joanna May, which was about cloning, which is actually just about twinning. And, and Stephen Pinker I encountered in a studio, and um, he was kind enough to say, although I had done no research at all, I had got it all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have some, some reason to think that actually uh, there is some value in we, in we people who, who make things up and who don't study things properly. Um, oddly, the, the, the writers and the scientists, there is a, we do think differently. We really do. And um, uh, uh, oddly enough, writers and scientists do sometimes seem, tend to marry each other, I have found. Uh, perhaps it's nature's way of modifying the genes. <laughs> but uh, the two-culture split, which was defined way back in the 50s by C.P. Snow, uh, does persist. And I think it's to do with the capacity for, for understanding the sort of sensitivities of language. Uh, language is the writer's forte. Uh, yours is experimentation, really. Um, the subtleties of language can get us all into trouble. Um, words define and limit uh, our thinking, uh, especially when it does come to research into personality, into this whole area we're talking about. Uh, I mean, male or female, for example, uh, tends to define a two-way split in people. Uh, it's defined by our reproductive organs, whereas actually male and female is something, uh, I, it seems to me, much vaguer than that, but you would know. <laughs> but... Um, uh, we're, we're, it's too crude a distinction. And I sometimes think anim, anima and animus, which is yoid, the, the way Jung uh, separated them out, might be a more useful tool when you're regarding the aspect male or female, what are traditionally male or female aspects of personality, but perhaps are not. Uh, and another example, 10 years ago, I was with um, the geneticist Steve Jones on a, on a book tour, uh, and he was buoyant and cheerful because he had discovered, he thought, in those days, the gene for criminality. Um, there was going to be no looking back now for society. If you could only locate it, you could engineer it out. They were happy, innocent days. Uh, when I asked how he defined criminality, Steve seemed a little taken aback and replied, why all those people in prison, you know? <laughs> Uh, well, he was right up to a point. Some of us end up in prison and others don't. And it does seem to be there is a ge genetic proponent at work. 
Criminality runs in families, we're told, even when you factor out environmental issues. But the really clever criminals, as we all know, seldom end up in prison. Uh, behaving badly, criminality equals all those people in prison. It's an equation which doesn't quite balance, but we do, uh, the, third, the first two are abstract concepts, uh, right brain stuff. Uh, the third uh, people in prison is literal and left brainy. Uh, but we do have somehow, all of us, to come to terms with this. Uh, we all want to get home safely tonight without being mugged. What was once safely theoretical is becoming practical. And the old uh, theory of what prison was for, which was a mixture of retribution, deterrence, and reformation, is beginning to look out of date uh, as we look at all the research into personality and, 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 and studies that you lot have been doing. Um, more research is needed. And I'd like to offer a really fuzzy right brain notion to the, to, um, to the research that the gene for criminality is elusive simply because it is negative and language dependent. And you turned it on its head and started looking for the justice gene, something positive and survival-friendly uh, might emerge, which was useful uh, both for the individual and for society. Um, if we have a concept of a people, a concept of a justice gene, all those people in prison are simply at the far end, the wrong end of a kind of normal distribution bell curve. The justice gene. I'd argue, and new research does back, back me up, is hardwired into us, uh, like the one that is only activated when the child is abused. Uh, the child cries at the age of three or four, it's not fair, and one wonders where he gets this concept from. It's certainly not evident in the world he's born into. Some are born poor, some rich, some health, wealth healthy, some weakly, yet the child craves justice. Uh, some are born with a strong sense of it, these are the law-abiding, and some are not. These are the badly behaved and the violent, just as some follow through their other instincts with more ardor than others, highly sexed, weakly sexed, inquisitive, not inquisitive. We take our place within the various bell curves which compose our, the complexity of our personality. Uh, see in the cry it's not fair and the wail which follows it, the child demanding justice, in the same way as it demands food, warmth, affection, satisfaction, in fact, in the quest for survival. Uh, a Dr. Hauser of Harvard University has been recently comparing chimps and humans directly in these amazingly clever studies sociobiologists and others do these days to discover our genetic underpinnings. Uh, chimps are more patient than humans, he concludes. I read this in The, in the Economist, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> chimps are more patient than humans, he concludes. Chimps maximize advantage to themselves. Chimps also, by the way, punish thieves. Uh, but patience is older than fairness. The fairness gene, the justice gene, has, 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 has evolved more recently than that. Uh, the sense of fairness is genetic, Hauser concludes, not rooted in culture. It has to be in order to have evolved in humans since the human chimp split four million years back. And not everyone possesses it to the same degree, he concludes. Uh, back to the bell curve as we cluster together in our current civic normality, uh, those inflicting and demanding justice out at one end and those receiving it at the other all those people in prison behaving badly, where the policeman pounce. Most people don't worry it about it at all until they get mugged. Uh, and see in sex offenders, in the paedophiles, for example, uh, they're at the thin outer edges of what is at the wrong end of the bell curve in ter terms of social desirability. Uh, and in these offenders, you see the dramatic failure of the uh, justice gene. I think your research has proved otherwise, but I didn't know about that. Uh, a lack of understanding of appropriate power relations, which paedophilia is ac acutely uh, just not fair. Well, we all know it instinctively. And if new knowledge suggests in a particular crime, retribution is pointless, reformation and deterrence fairly hopeless, and restraint is all we have left, 
there is no point in that restraint, restraint being punitive. One prison does not suit all, which we are all in such a mess. Uh, it's in our, in our views of, 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 of what is worthy of punishment, what is what you have to deter, where you just simply have to restrain people. Different crimes require different, different answers, which is expensive. Uh, it's interesting that as our politicians insist more and more on the uh, importance of nurture, uh, its insistence that all are born equal, the research that is emerging from the labs tends to uh, tilt the balance towards nature rather more than nurture. Uh, the pendulum swings this way and that and has for many years. Uh, decades, though, since we stopped giving little boys uh, guns for toys and a long time, but, and, and little girls, although we try to bring, bring them up to be little boys more, uh, still crave pink and purple and little pony stuff around the age of eight, nine. And uh, the little boys, uh, although deprived of guns, keep on picking up sticks and pointing them and crying, bang, bang, you're dead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faith. <laughs> So we have already quite a number of themes introduced, and I'm particularly grateful that you pointed to um, the idea of fairness and justice as possibly an opposite of the um, uh, talking about violence. So we will pick that up, I'm quite sure. And now we come to James Blair. James Blair leads the Unit on Effective Cognitive Neuroscience at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda in Washington. James Blair received his PhD in psychology at UCL in 1993, and I first met him as a PhD student at the MRC um, Cognitive Development Unit. He subsequently moved um, to the then newly founded Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL, and there, as my close colleague, he helped form and lead the developmental group. But sadly, in 2002, he was poached by NIMH. James Blair's work on psychopaths is um, certainly, in my view, groundbreaking. He proposed that psychopaths really are different. The essence of their disorder is not criminality, but it lies in an insufficiency of emotion. And James Blair has related this particular insufficiency to a very central component of the emotional brain, the amygdala. So James, how do we know that psychopaths are different? Right, well... I was going to begin with this question, but partly in answer to Uta and partly to follow on from Faye, I just wanted to make one point before I go any further, but just in case there can be no ambiguity. So um, the, uh, the issue is this, that a lot of antisocial behavior is perfectly adaptive. There's, it's a good plan. It could be that I was, or somebody happened to be located in an august building in the center of London, discovered that some very valuable books located in that building <laughs> had a good check out of the security system, realized it was terribly in lapse, and there was no chance of me getting caught if I walked off with these books, and then promptly did. Not that I'm going to, and I strongly suggest none of you do that either. But all I'm saying is that um, if that was the case, if I knew that I could commit a crime that was going to get me vast amounts of money, and the chance of being caught is minimal, decision-making-wise, it's a cunning plan. It's, um, I mean, I should do it. If I'm not going to get caught and I'm going to make loads of money, I'm an idiot if I don't go and go and steal all that thing. <laughs> now, the fact is, we don't usually do that because we tend to... Our, our, our brain's decision-making apparatus makes us value costs more than it makes us value the um, equivalent benefits. But the fact is that um, um, a lot of antisocial behavior is appropriate. It's the right thing. You know, for that individual, they, they were computing 
an accurate cost-benefit analysis. It may have resulted in them going to jail, but that's just one of the costs. And I'm not going to talk about anybody like that in this you know, minute, uh, couple of minutes of talk. That sort of adaptive crime, the vast majority of people who are in jail, I'm not referring to anything about them in, at all. What I'm referring to is a much more extreme individual. Some of the cases that Temi was talking about, and then some um, slightly different, but that sort of lifetime persistent, which she... she coined a term of, an individual who starts off very early in life and continues for, um, uh, you know, for a very long time, um, the individual with psychopathy. And that's who I'm going to just concentrate for just for the next few minutes. Now, the first sort of question is, is this the individual with psychopathy? I, I'm, pre- I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hannibal Lecter's um, uh, rampage through the movies, um, and, um, and that's Hannibal Lecter there, um, uh, as played... Um, uh, in one of those movies, two of those movies, I think, maybe even three now. I think the last one's just come out. Um, but that individual is not an individual with psychopathy. He would not meet criteria for psychopathy. I could not have Hannibal Lecter in one of my studies. He is not a, a good enough psychopath. He is not a psychopath. What you have to be to be a psychopath is to score more than 30 out of 40 on each of these, uh, on, on um, um, the, what's called the psychopathy checklist. Despite the fact this says it's the youth version, it's actually the adult version due to a um, PowerPoint error on my part. But anyway, um, uh, there's 20 behavioral items. You to score between zero and two on each of those items. In order to be classified as an individual with psychopathy, you've got to score more than um, 30 out of 40. Often when people look at this the first time, they see a bit about you know, early childhood problems, um, promiscuity, and think, well, I could score a bit on that. I could score a bit on that. But it's very unlikely that you're going to be scoring more than 30 out of 40 on the on paired psychopathy checklist. Um, and, um, uh, and the real stunning feature of individuals with psychopathy is not, just as Uta was saying, it's not the antisocial behavior. The stunning feature of individuals with psychopathy is their emotional problems. These people don't get bothered, and I'll show you some pictures of their brain really not being bothered by the distress of other individuals. Um, these individuals don't have um, uh, significant or have significantly reduced attachments to significant others. They don't um, bond well with partners or with children or with parents. Um, and it's that emotional feature that's the distinctive hallmark of psychopathy and marks them out as so very, very different from other populations. I was originally interested in psychopathy because what I found so bizarre is why on earth we ever cared about other individuals. Why did we care about whether we hurt other individuals or not? And there's this phenomena called the moral conventional distinction. So you have things like uh, care-based morality as you know, somebody hitting another person, somebody um, damaging another person's property. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's, you know, there's a victim there. There's a clearly identified v- victim that we process. In fact, I asked you, anybody in the audience, well, probably most people in the audience at least, why is it bad for one person to hit another? Your most likely response is because somebody will get hurt. And that contrasts with other sorts of rules that we have in society. And another very dominant form of rules is conventions or social disorder-based conventions. So people talking in class in the the classroom or in this uh, stolen picture from the office, a man, you know, if I stood up now and started dancing in front of you, uh, hopefully none of you would suffer. I'm not that bad a dancer, but um, but it would be a deeply inappropriate thing for me, um, uh, me to do. And really, um, to comment really on John's about the permissibility issue, one of the really stunning features about this care-based morality, this dichotomy between care-based morality and social disorder-based convention, is if we say, in this culture, in this school, in this alternative universe, you're allowed to do whatever you want to. You can do whatever you want to. And then you're asked to judge these two children. Is it okay now for this boy to hit this other boy? So we're in another universe now. There's all of the other rules don't apply. I could ask you now all, I won't ask you because I'm sure most of you would just not want to respond, but, um, but if you answer in your own mind, would you allow this boy to hit this other boy in this alternative universe? And my guess would be most of you thinking, no, of course I won't allow it. It doesn't care whether there's a rule or not. It, it matters that the other person would be hurt. I would try and stop this going on. But if we have a social dif- disorder, I mean a conventional dis- transgression, so you know, people talking in the classroom or me dancing on this table and there's no rule about it, then you're much more likely to allow me if the rule has gone away. So we have selective 
permissibilities, where we allow things, um, or we're very, uh, very allowing of social conventional transgressions, it's much more difficult. Not that it can't occur, and obviously if you're um, weaker in this um, emotional responding, then you're much more likely to allow. And, and that's really the idea, is that basically what happens as soon as you hear the idea of one person hitting another person, you start coding effectively the distress of that other individual. It's aversive, you don't want it to happen, it's nasty, it's wrong, we shouldn't allow this boy to hit this other boy. And the idea is that what, what's really going on here is that we have these sort of basic emotional learning mechanisms that allow us to link the nastiness, the sadness, the um, upset of another person being in pain or frightened with the things that have caused that pain or upset. And so we make that association. And so the next time we even think about the action that caused the person in pain uh, previously, we um, activate um, uh, particular crucial areas of the brain that are necessary for emotional processing, and that guides us away from it. It well, prevents us doing this sort of decision. We, do, we avoid the bad decision. And really, this is just some um, uh, imaging, brain imaging data. So you're looking at which regions of the brain show appropriate responses to fearful, this, in this case, fearful expressions. So as you can see, as you go to the right, the face gets more frightened, and on the left, it gets less frightened. And you, what you're looking at is which areas of the brain in healthy children um, versus um, other populations become more responsive um, when you're seeing a frightened versus a neutral face. And what you see in healthy children and children with ADHD as well, which is um, you know, another childhood disorder associated with behavioral problems, but not this sort of typically um, highly, or not in this particular selected sample, not antisocial behavior, just, just other sorts of um, uh, behaviors. Um, you see a nice response. They show significantly more activity to the fearful face than the neutral expression. But these are children with psychopathic traits, and these children just don't show that, nor do adults with the, with the disorder either. They don't show the increased response to fearful face. So they don't have the power, the, the empathic response to another person's distress that's so important for socialization and guiding us away from um, uh, bad actions. And I'll just end up with one example of an individual I worked with when I was back here, an adult uh, with psychopathy, just to give you how bad it can get when people are behaving badly in this sort of way. He started off his street crime life holding people up at knife point, but decided after a while that this uh, was just such an inefficient way of doing things because they often fought back that he took a brick with him and used them, came up from behind and hit them over the back of the head and then just took their wallet. And this, that particular you know, style of what he was doing was efficient in the way that he managed to extract his money because he didn't have any risk at all. But the fact is he clearly wasn't coding, as any of the other um, you know, street muggers were coding, the um, distress that he was causing. He was ruining each of the, his individual victims' lives each time he did this particular act of extreme aggression. Um, and it was that sort of decision-making process that was so clearly out of um, sync in this individual. And, of course, even from his own point of view, it was a bad decision because immediately he was marked down in that particular district as the one street mugger who was using this particular, particular heinous type of action, and he was picked up very shortly afterwards. But that's just an example of how bad the decision-making can get in individuals with this, uh, with this condition who just aren't responsive or are much, much reduced responsive to the distress of others. But again, just to reiterate it one last time, this is not... Individuals with this disorder are the rarity, even within jail, there are less than 20% of people in jail. This is not the sort of person you're typically thinking about when you're thinking in terms of um, individuals uh, who may have gone to jail and make criminal uh, lifestyles. It's a very, very selective. Um, um, population. And that's it. Now, John asked to be told a little more by Terry Moffat about this interesting nature-nurture interaction. Perhaps you could Start a little bit on that. Elaborate was a little more. Was there anything in particular that no, you wanted to? No, you said that there was the, 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 the gene yeah, that, that only became activated when mm -hmm. the child was abused. That fascinates me. I mean, <clears throat> how was this not discovered before? <clears throat> I mean, is this a fact? 
As it turns out, it it's, it's not as unusual as you might think. So the, the concept in science would be called the, the interaction between genes and environment, and it's very common in the study of heart disease. We have, uh, for example, genes that wouldn't really relate to <laughs> risk for a heart attack unless you eat a high-fat diet. Yes. So they influence your okay. vulnerability to the environment. Or um, there are there's even research from dentistry suggesting that there are genes that are related to gum disease and our capacity to lose our teeth as we get older, but those are really, their effects are activated only if we smoke well, cigarettes. You see, I, yeah, I, so this yeah. is really applying a, a, a common notion that genes are dependent upon our uh, lifestyle and just bringing that into the realm of antisocial yeah. behavior. I immediately applied my novelist mind to it and saw it as a little demon lying inside <laughs> it, just waiting to be activated, just with its little fist clenched saying, somebody abuse me so that I can have an excuse yeah. to wreak havoc in the world. You're telling me that's not the case. Well, I'm like glad to, to hear that. I like to focus on the children that had the other variant of the gene who, even though they experienced maltreatment, did not um, engage in the cycle of violence. And so yeah, they're not interesting. We, yeah, well, there you go. To a novelist, they're not interesting. To a psychologist, they're very interesting. Writing about good people is never interesting. <laughs> right, Faye? They're great. I was interested, if it might just, uh, uh, I won't hold the thing, I'm just fascinated when you were talking, that I remember that uh, Uta mentioned a book of mine, the Book of Evidence, that was published in 89, and I was looking at my notebook for it the other day, um, and one of the first notes I had was, is it wrong to kill people? And I had, you know, uh, forget about the, the grieving widow and the, the children orphan, and so just, is it wrong to kill people? And I remember at the time finding it very, very hard to answer this question. Now, does this make me one of your people with the 40 <laughs> traits? But I, I could not find a sufficiently convincing answer to it. I knew in my sentimentalist side, I mean, sentimentalist, stricter sense of the word, you know, the, 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 the side of me that has sentiments, I knew that it was wrong. But rationally, I could not see any reason not to kill people. I mean, this... This fascinated me, and it still fascinates me. But you would have to define what is wrong. How well, would you define if it was in a religious sense? But that's or, the point. Or, or what, what is but this concept the, but, that but, we have? But that's exactly the point. Where do you... How do you... Anyway, sorry. But I think what you did was you actually got away from the... You know, you tried to push away all that was most crucial for allowing you to answer that question. So you first off got rid of the grieving widow and the children, and those victims are crucial for generating your sense of wrong. And then you also wanted to get rid of your sentimentalist side. This, you know, the, the picture that's just disappeared, but the amygdala is crucial for your sentimentalist side. If you get rid of that, then indeed you are left with nothing other than with um, rational um, thought. And rational thought doesn't really buy you very much in this type of moral development. I mean, it will tell you that maybe why, sh why shouldn't kill five people? Um, I should kill one person to save the five. It might actually tell you that um, uh, because you just do the maths, but you wouldn't really care too much about it. And you certainly wouldn't if we suddenly had, you know, the, if we had to smother a baby to save the five people. That's a much more difficult decision to make. And that's because all of the emotional systems come into by all the crucial things that allows you to know that indeed that, thing, that particular thing is wrong. Irrespective of what wrongness is, this is wrongness at a human level is what your emotional systems tell you it is. Yes, but if we look at the history of the 20th century, you know, and it's, it's I mean, one of the dreadful things about it now is that the atrocities of the 20th century are becoming cliched now. But, you know, we have uh, evidence of concentration camp guards saying, yes, it was kind of difficult to push the children into the gas chambers, but we knew we had to do it, so we did it. So, you know, if there are only a, a, quite a small number of these people in the world... Were they all cleverly chosen by the SS to run the, the, the camps? Were, did Pol Pot find all these uh, 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 pathological people to, to, to do all that killing? I mean, there is something that puzzles us when we look at the, the vast numbers of people that are killed by relatively small numbers of people. I, I mean, I can't answer in the historical case for that, for that particular example, but... I know that it has happened before. I know that the procedure for picking torturers in Greece, um, uh, you know, 50-odd years back, was indeed you selected the person who was the least responsive when you ex um, exposed them to a very minimal level of just suffering on another individual. And then also you can gradually graduate people up to suffering. I mean, again, it's a very difficult case to answer in, you know, in these sort of historical contexts. But certainly I know that regimes have used selection processes 
processes in order to make sure that they do pick for those less desirable jobs. Um, the yeah. um, um, the less emotionally responsive, and the fact is that the you know there is a huge gradation of emotional responsiveness in humans generally, and so it's not that difficult to I find. Would, uh, yeah, I'd like to think that that it was a selection process. What is much more frightening is that so-called ordinary people, kindly people, people with you know a deep sense of sentiment, given the permission and encouraged to do the worst things they can possibly dream of, we're perfectly happy to do it. That's the really scary bit. I think, though... Sorry, I no, think, shut up. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just respond this one time as well, and then I'll also shut up for a but the But I think, actually, that that would be surprising on the basis of the literature out there, is if actually all people can be made... You know, there has been that thought that all people can be made to do that. Now, there are circumstances when... Or everybody. So one of the things you actually see is there's a thing called reactive aggression. We're almost programmed... As the we have a basic threat circuit that uh, first off, if there was a tiger walking into the room now, we'd all freeze in the hope that the tiger didn't notice us. Then we'd try and run away, and we would all go through this door as the tiger got closer. But if one of us was cornered in the corner there, the last thing you'd do is you'd fight that tiger. You'd have a reactive aggression episode. That's that's what you're programmed to actually do. And so we can frighten people into being really aggressive. But to actually do this sort of cold-blooded um, 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 antisocial action, on the ba- as far as I'm concerned, on the basis of the literature as it exists now, I think it's very diffi- it would be very difficult. It, it shouldn't but, happen, but it did happen. But again, we don't again, know, because of the selection, we don't know what the selection process I mean, I, the only time that I've seen it really well documented was indeed for these Greek torturers, yeah. and there it was documented that they were clearly engaged in a selection process. I, you know, yeah. There is plenty of evidence, though, that uh, people who are interested in aggression, who enjoy it, uh, perhaps psychopathic people, people who have, are aware of their own lack of emotional empathy to victims, do look for jobs like this. So uh, they would be attracted to those kinds of posts and apply for them, I would think. There's a magazine in the United States called The Soldier of Fortune, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, uh, it actually sells lots and lots of copies, uh, and uh, it's orientated towards the interest group of um, mercenaries. And there are advertisements in the back, uh, in the want ad section, for uh, women who are willing to breed with so- soldiers of fortune uh, to create a master race of psychopaths. And apparently people <laughs> do answer the ads. <laughs> yes, that's true. So it's, uh, aggression, aggression can be a choice of people who are interested in it. It's not always... Imposed yeah, upon but it, it's someone not really, unwillingly. It's not really a, aggression I'm talking about. It's you know the, the the chicken farmers who ran the the so-called final solution. They were not particularly aggressive people. They didn't seem. They don't seem to us to have been. They were just ordinary Joe soaps who said, "Oh yeah, I'll 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 kill six million people. That that's that's all right by me." That doesn't seem to require... In, in fact, you know, at least the soldier of fortune people, they're being honest. They're saying, I'm an aggressive individual and I want to mate with these people and, you know, make... You know, we know who they are. We can identify them. What's scary about what happened in the last century and what happened in previous centuries, what happens all the time, is that perfectly ordinary people given permission to do and encouraged to do the worst things they can dream of will say, yes, we'll do it. You know, none of us sitting here is willing to say, you know, I'm capable of murder, I'm capable of being a a concentration camp guard. But yet we're faced with the evidence that lots and lots and lots of people did it on, you know, fairly scanty uh, encouragement. You know, the Nazi program wasn't the most persuasive thing ever. Uh, You know, well, it really wasn't. It was a pretty stupid and silly thing. People said, yeah, we love this. This is good. We'll, We'll do this. That's, what's, that's where we, we bring in the question of, is there evil? Is there something outside us that infects us? I don't think there is. But it's all very well for me to say there isn't such a thing as evil. How do I then explain people, perfectly normal people, behaving in, a, in an evil way? Because the nurture which has restrained that nature has, has, is too weak, or something replaces it, so you are indeed given permission and so, so this, this other natural thing, which is in human beings, I suspect, uh, fairly aggressive, you want to survive at all costs. Uh, now we're conditioned very severely into all being nice. Uh, little boys are, are, are not allowed to play 
pay past the parcel in case, case they knock over little girls. And, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you take away that conditioning, I think you're left with something fairly savage, which you could then describe as evil. Yeah, yeah that's true. Anyway, we really, really enjoyed this, uh, this bit of discussion, but I think it is now also is. time to bring in the audience. And if you have questions, raise your hand and uh, you will be given a microphone and then you will stand up. So the first one is here. Uh, the second person uh, right, yes, next to you. The third person right in the back. Fourth person here, fifth person here. So lots and lots. Sixth person, Louis Walpert. <laughs> Um, just on the point of John Banville's point about how ordinary people can behave appallingly, I'd like to take issue with James Blair's argument that it's not documented. I'm, I'm thinking of Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men. Christopher Browning did a study of middle, uh, people in their 30s and 40s who were reserve policemen, who were not fervent Nazis, but went to Poland and, and, and collaborated with the execution of large numbers of, of, of Jews. Um, they didn't like doing it. They thought it was uh, an unpleasant duty, but they did it mainly out of a sense of camaraderie. They didn't want to let the side down. They weren't pressurized. They were given the opportunity not to. They were told by the commander that they did not have to do this, but they went along with it. Um, and, and it's a, a fascinating documentation of how people can get lured into this. I, I, I see you, you know the book. Well, yeah. I mean, I, sorry, am I able to... I think one of the things that's very complicated with these sorts of things is exactly what people, you know, it's exactly when you use the word collaborate into this, what exactly you're doing. I mean, you know, we're at a time. I mean, I, I was reading in the paper today where um, they were, it was the Herald Tribune, they were talking about all the um, latest complications about whether, how you name um, uh, um, uh, extreme interrogation use. And since I work for the US government now, I have to be extremely careful about what I say about these sort of things. So, the, so I'm, I'm trying to say it in a way that's very friendly to all parties. But the, um, <laughs> in, a, in a very difficult situation. And of course, here I am doing this. And at some fundamental level, what I'm doing right now in front of you is collaborating in that sort of thing that's gone on because it's obviously unpleasant. Um, but the fact is, I'm not pressing the buttons. And that's the. Sorry, but those people were—they were—they were shooting people. Well, I—I mean, again, I think that I—I really want. I mean, the the literature is not good as regards, uh, and at least the studies that you know, the other studies that have been done is really not good at persuading people to actually do these. I mean, again, I you know, I I'd want to see whether really the percentage that we're doing it. Maybe, maybe it's right. Maybe it's right. I maybe this all is wrong. It is possible. I obviously don't think so. And I, as a human being, hope not. Because um, the fact is, if it really is that trivial, then um, um, and there really isn't this fundamental difference, then that's obviously not a good position to be in. I just really do see the fundamental difference in my work between people who are emotionally responsive and those that aren't. What I'd really need to do would be to go back in time and test out those individuals, see whether they are fundamentally less responsive. You know, they just happen to be fundamentally less responsive. Or maybe there are indeed environmental circumstances, you know, following on from uh, Temi's work, that do allow you to push down... And we know there are some anyway, because certainly with outgroups, if we get vigorous enough about an outgroup, we can change the way that we're attending to the individuals of that outgroup, and so consequently we don't feel the suffering that they feel. Whether we can do that right in front of them, you know, right in front. I mean, if this literature is, you know, correct, and it turns out really they were very responsive in all other conditions, perhaps that and very extreme conditional version of that was going on. It's just that um, uh, if that is going on, then those people ought to have suffered extreme post-traumatic stress disorder when they came back. If they didn't, then we can be relatively confident that they were these sorts of people. Because even people who've gone to jail and committed, you know, they committed acts of extreme violence in jail and at the time thought that it was proven, it's very common for those individuals to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder afterwards. But, but you clearly disagree, so... <laughs> it's really a complex question. There's no doubt about it. And I think we're not going to solve this tonight. But there are many more questions that have to be asked. Please stand up. In yes. fact, my, um, I'm, I'm pursuing the same theme. I'm not a scientist, and I'm referring to something that I remember reading, and I hope it triggers something in somebody else's mind, about somebody who did an experiment, I think with students, dividing them randomly into two groups. And one was 
was the prisoner and one was the warder, and they were allowed to administer electric shocks. And he had to stop because he was appalled by the results. Yes, Which would suggest that if people are given permission to be dreadful, they will be dreadful. Yes, thank you. That is, is, is a famous experiment known as the Zimbardo experiment. And in fact, I think in a recent book, Zimbardo commented on how he himself uh, was, was guilty in actually allowing such an experiment <coughs> to happen. So rather than saying how bad of these... Uh, uh, this one group who became the jailers to behave so badly, it was, he, he could see that it was him who set it up, who might have allowed this. Anyway, it's a very complicated discussion um, as well, but thank you for raising this. Can I just maybe respond that that, is, that experiment was done um, some time ago, maybe 20 years ago now, is that right? Uh, more than that. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the technology to look inside the brain the way that James does in his research. And he's now found um, lack of amygdala activation to pain and fear in people who are uh, develop as psychopaths. What would be a really interesting hypothesis to test uh, if it were ethical, is whether people put in an experiment like this where they are given permission and encouraged to hurt others and do follow through on that, if their amygdala activation is somehow changed in that context. But that work hasn't been done. So we, what we'd like to know is how malleable is the amygdala? How suggestible might it be as a brain structure? Thank you. Now, we had other people lined up right, right at the back now. Yes, I... Just like to ask um, for the team's comments on um, uh, going back to this question that was discussed regarding the behaviour of the uh, Nazis in the Second World War, which is a, a very interesting discussion. Um, I mean, what, one of the things that the Nazis used was was to create the idea that the Jews and the Slavs were subhuman, and I wonder how important that is. And the other idea that they used was that essentially the Jews were involved in a plot against the nation in World War I and really caused the downfall of Germany. And, the, and so the, gr it was, the group was threatened, much as uh, I suppose uh, America's felt threatened by 9-11 and has behaved rather badly in Iraq. Um, and I just wonder wh whether these things aren't perhaps at the root of causing ordinary people to behave in... A, a very appalling way. Thank you. Faye, would you like to comment? Well, I think on... once, once you define somebody as an enemy, all things become possible. You can get people to, to, to bomb Dick Dresden by saying those civilians down there are of a different kind to you. If they don't get you, if, if we don't get them, they'll get us first. This is the thinking in the Cold War. Uh, I mean, it, 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 all, it seems to be natural in groups of people to hate the, to, in the tribe, to hate the tribe over the other side of the hill and run over the hill and kill them before they run over and kill you. I mean, I think, in, and, and, and in the case of Germany, you found the enemy within. It wasn't another territory. It was, it was the, the evil within, which is, is, is rotting the fabric like communism. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very normal. It's normal human behavior. I think the most cheerful thing we've, we've heard so far is the sense of post-traumatic stress disorder after you have done something <laughs> awful that actually there is, I mean, it's known as remorse. You have bad dreams, and that this also seems to be a part of human nature. Thank you, Faye. So who was next? Uh, this is a question for the um, scientist. Uh, have you looked at the pattern of attachment uh, in childhood uh, and whether this relates to delinquency in adulthood or psychopathy? Can study? you talk to that? Terry? Well, there's attachment and there's attachment. Um, there's attachment the way most of this, of us uh, lay people, and I count myself in this group, would think of it as the love between mother and child, the bond between uh, family members, uh, parents and children, siblings, and certainly uh, 
all the research on antisocial individuals who spend their whole life in a, an antisocial lifestyle suggests that those bonds are broken or are weak. Uh, and then there's another kind of attachment, which is a particular research paradigm within uh, the study of developmental psychology where um, a, a mother uh, goes out of the room and the child stays in the room with the experimenter and some time passes and then when the mother comes back the experimenter records whether the what the child's reaction is. Does the child run to the mother to seek uh, reassurance uh, and, and therefore show the bond or does the child carry on doing what they're doing, ignoring the mother, suggesting that the attachment bond has been broken? That kind of research doesn't routinely predict children's long-term delinquent offending or violent outcomes. Uh, so there is a disconnect there between what we commonly think of as attachment and the way we measure attachment in the laboratory. But I think that work is, people are working on bringing it together, but it's, so the answer is yes and no. Have we looked at attachment? Um, yes and no. Thank you, Terry. Now who was next? Um, I, no cue jumping, please. We have identified people before. Did you just come in as number seven? So sorry about this. <laughs> but I think the person in the orange shirt is next. Next she'll be stealing the documents in the, uh, <laughs> in the, in the yeah. front of the, of the building. <laughs> yes, this is an honesty test. Hi. Um, it was in the context of a discussion of different reasons that people can be found in situations where they might do heinous acts, such as um, uh, finding yourself as a worker in a concentration camp or in the Zimbardo experiment. Um, as against the kinds of psychopaths that Dr. Blair um, experiments with, I wondered about enjoyment uh, as a factor, enjoyment, um, getting off on the actual kind of um, pull of doing a psychopathic act to get something from it, as opposed to the gentleman who just walks up behind, uses a brick, um, picks up the bag and walks on, as if nothing happened. I wonder if you could comment on, on, on that. Is there something extra that the person gets from the... The literature, at least as regards the Home Office here, suggested that sadism was not associated with psychopathy. I haven't done any work on it, and I haven't seen any, you know addressed really directly but the literature that I knew of that was done in the home office suggested that sadism did not was not associated with psychopathy I don't know whether you've bumped into anything about it. no but I'd like to hear what the novelists have to say about that yes. because that's what makes that enjoyment of the victim suffering is what makes for a particularly juicy character <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a real page turner yeah I think that's that's true yeah we do want to read about people behaving badly and enjoying it because we can then both enjoy their crime vicariously and also feel morally superior to them. What I was thinking about at the start of that question certainly was there's a, uh, a diary by a, a Romanian Jew uh, called Sebastian, uh, absolutely superb diaries, and he writes about the way in which fascism and Nazism in Romania, and it wasn't imposed by the Germans. They, they did it all by themselves. Um, and he was walking in the street one day, and he met Mercy Eliade, who was an exquisitely educated man who did extraordinary work on, on mythology of religion. And, and uh, I mean, a, a great scholar, uh, a superbly civilized human being. And he said to Sebastian, you know, they're taking the houses away from the Jews. They haven't given me one yet. And I remember thinking that of all the horrors that Sebastian talked about in the book of Jews being hanged on meat hooks and so on, somehow this is the one that stayed with me because this wasn't a, a, a great criminal. This wasn't a person who was doing terrible things dark, in the dark of the night to, to people. This wasn't a man who was enjoying. He wasn't getting his fair share out of this. And the, what fascinated me about that was the failure of imagination, the failure of a, an exquisitely educated man like that, exquisite sensibility like that, the failure to imagine what it's like to have your house taken away from you and having your family driven out because you're Jewish. Um, I've never forgotten that. And that, that, I cannot understand it. I can't offer any explanation to it. I can't say that I wouldn't do it myself, but I sincerely hope that I wouldn't. 
Now, that raises the question of, does a nation, does a people just lose its reason? Does, does a whole country, a whole state just go mad for a period? Sometimes I think that's true. I look at Northern Ireland in the 30 years from uh, uh, 69 up to 89, and sometimes I feel that the entire place was just crackers <laughs> because they were fighting for nothing. They knew that they would get nothing. They did, it was, as Faye said, it was one tribe fighting another tribe. But at least in that, there was blood. There was blood and there was territory. There was people wanting things, maybe people getting enjoyment from slaughtering each other. But in the case of Eliade, this was a man who should have known better. And an extraordinary number of Romanian intellectuals were as bad and worse than Eliade. And here's the, the punchline to it. Eliade went to America, went to Yale, became a great scholar, covered up his past, and nobody knew about this until Sebastian's diaries came out. So he fooled. He was a friend of friends of mine. He was a great scholar and a great man. And yet he had done these things. In, at least he had felt this way in the war. Even just feeling that way was a great crime for someone like him. I think it brings us to the importance of fiction. I think what we have today is, is a whole race of young people who have been trained in empathy. They have been trained in, think, in putting themselves in other people's shoes, which of course is what, what happens in, in fiction. But I think people are practically punch drunk by, by now because it comes to you from, from, from all directions. But I think uh, I mean, if you are a writer, it's very surprising to discover that other people don't project ahead into the effect that their actions have on other people. But, but, but again, it's sort of right brain, left brain, and, and the right brainers, which is, who are so effective, probably do need us left brainers if we're going to allow this concept of uh, left brain, right brain in at all. I think we now have a question from Louis Walpert. Uh, Could you also stand up, please? Yes, is this on? Is this on? Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's just perhaps worth recalling that there may be a genetic beha- basis for good behaviour if we come to reciprocal altruism and Hamilton's ideas about how we want to behave in the way that we want other people to behave towards us, and particularly in relation to our family. Just remember what J.B.S. Haldane said. He would lay down his life for eight of his cousins... In other words, what evolution is concerned about is survival of genes. And we all want to to reciprocate when people do well. If people behave badly, then then we want to punish them. And so I would be very surprised if there weren't a genetic basis for some bad behavior. And please, when you talk about genetics of these, do not talk about the gene for justice. It'll be many, many, many genes. Yes. Thank you. That was, that was a well-spoken comment. Now, um, it, I think it is your turn. You're, you were the next. <coughs> I, sorry, the lady with the green... Yes, she, she had her hand up first. Um, it sounds a bit from what some of you... Have... The, the gentleman is next. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, you're... from what some of you have said, as if between nurture and nature, we're stuck between a kind of rock and a hard place, and... I wondered whether what you all felt about the notion of free will. I mean, it rather sounds from what you're saying as if we're completely programmed in our behaviour. Somehow, between nurture and nature, there's, there's not, not very much we can freely do about our lives. Who would you like this, the answer to be from here? This uh, is a novelist or scientist? Uh, one scientist and one novelist, perhaps. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Any takers here? James, be brave. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a tricky one. I mean, <laughs> the, I think um, um, it's, yeah, I don't think that's, an, that's a really answer that we could give. I mean, they, or the type of, the ultimate implication of a lot of the work is very deterministic. Uh, yet, um, the fact that um, uh, the very fact that you can have goal-directed action suggests that at least whether there's free will, there's, a, there's certainly clearly the feeling that we have free will, 
whether we really do, whether it just happens to be a little bit of chance for effects that prop up, pop up this goal at any one time and environmental effects that pop up this goal at any one time, um, might be. But the fact... You, so in short, I, in an articulate way, have to say we don't have an answer. I think I, I wish I'd started like that and just said that, and that would have been made my life so much simpler. No, thank you, James. I think, I think that was a good well, one. It, it, it seems to me that the, the very notion of free will is again another example of spilt religion. That we, you know, free will against what? There, are, are we? Uh, do we have uh, moral determinism built into us? Uh, and, you know, okay, therefore we must exercise free will against this. I, I think it's a, a meaningless concept, uh, I'm afraid. I, I, I don't understand what the notion of free will means. When I was a child being brought up as a Catholic, I knew perfectly well. But when I grew to be, you know, <laughs> you know some kind of adult, I, I, I forgot about these things because they, they, it, it is literally nonsense, I think. It doesn't mean anything. But again, if you if you think of children's stories, they they they're about 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 um, children like being read to stories which have a shape in which the bad are punished and the good are rewarded, and the good are rewar- the good are defined somehow as those who have free will and and exercise it in a way which is pleasing to the child, and and it seems to me that that. It's very hard to act as if we didn't believe in it. Otherwise, what are we? It's a very depressing notion that you, you are simply the product of, 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 of your, your heredity and, and, and whoever happens to have conditioned you in childhood. Well, you feel there mm-hmm. must be, and, and certainly we all act as if there was, in our desire to punish wrongdoers or throw them in prison or even chimpanzees who will punish thieves. But life, it, life, life is a very depressing prospect, at <laughs> all, honestly. Um, and, you know, if you look at the children's stories, the, the children are on the side of the good because the good get all the goods. <laughs> they get the prince or the princess. They it's get, true. you know, lots of food. It's, yes, you know, it's all true. those stories have to do with getting lots and lots of food. So it's, it's not that the good are good, it's that they, they get things. No, but the kind impulse is, is rewarded, I suppose. You help the old lady across oh, the street. I, I wish I could agree with you. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see it. Different sets of fairy stories, obviously, yes. and uh, <laughs> different cultures. We, we had first a question here, and then the next question, gentlemen, in the front. Yeah, we are uh, inventing or discovering genes each day, new and gene. It's like fundamental particle in physical terms. Is there a gene of mindlessness which most of the society is suffering? Or, and is it an infectious gene which can infect all the media, tabloid, and everything nearly? Is there an infectious gene? Mm. An infectious gene to make us more violent than we have ever been? Is there a gene of mindlessness which you have discovered? You are talking of (laughs) genes and other. Is there a gene of mindlessness? No, we're working on the easy behaviors first, I think. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to be a bit harder. (laughs) To to take your point seriously, it's... You say a lot of genes are being discovered every day. A lot of genes are being undiscovered every day as soon as they're discovered as well. Discovery so, or invention. I think it's an invention. No, it would be, it would be discovery, I believe. But uh, we do have a problem with the genetic research moving painfully slowly because a lot of it is not replicating. And as uh, Lewis Wolpert so kindly uh, reminded us, it's not appropriate to talk about a gene for anything because human behavior and human health, human heart function, human lung function are so complicated that they're affected by multiple genes operating in the context of our diet, our exercise, our lifestyle, our child rearing. So the, um, the idea that we'll ever get to the point of looking for a gene for mindlessness, I think, uh, is uh, you know, just so far out there from reality that it's difficult to, to respond, really. Is there a probability? Sorry, one, one, one question only, but thank you. The next question was gentlemen here. And then there was another question 
right at the back, and it might well have to be our last one. Yes, you will be the next. Could you please stand up? Yes, I'd like to ask a very large number of, of questions. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> ask a big one. <laughs> I hope that I won't behave too badly in response. I, because I live in a society, I, I, I'm walking around where there is some kind of approval for people who actually direct where the society is going, what it's doing, some kind of approval. Then, according to the Lancet, I'm calling for what is in effect going to be I, the murder of 100,000 odd uh, people, which means, of course, with that, the mutilation of something like half a million people. These are genocidal figures. And this society seems to be figuring, well, that's, that's all right. Or it's going along with it. I, the other two contributions I wanted to make is that I saw the other day on the street a couple of I, not very well-dressed men in, in an argument uh, with each other involving actually pushing and pulling. Some police stopped by and seemed to have settled it, went away. These two men were standing beside a street. One of them then said something else, and the other fellow pushed him. Attempted murder, and I'm sure it, it was just a very, very easy thing to do if you're just over, over upset. Yeah. You know? But it was attempted murder. And so should we stop here because we, we I, are I'd running like out to, of time? I'd like to make a third contribution because <laughs> you people, I'm yeah, addressing you directly now, asking something of you because you're in a very, very... I, dangerous, threatening uh, field. I'm referring to those you, you work with. I, there are different kinds of science. Some kinds of science, like astronomy, necessarily, up until very recently, involved just observation. I hope that in your work, you'll try to make your science be purely observational. Thank you. I Thank think you. these are really not so much questions as amplifications <laughs> and comments. I think we probably have time for uh, one more question. Yes, here. I wanted to ask about where the brain findings might take us next uh, with psychopathy. I get the impression societies don't really know what to do with psychopaths. We can incarcerate them when we catch them, when they offend. But is there hope that understanding how their brains are working and how they're different from other people taking us anywhere in terms of finding out how we can deal with them better? Well, that's, thank you for that question. I think that's for both the scientists to respond to. James, you already nearly started, so... <laughs> Well, I'm, um, as you might have guessed already, an optimistic human being. And so, um, um, yes, I think that this is very clear. Um, we have, I mean, the crucial thing to understand with psychopathy is that it's an emotional disorder. It's not a disorder of antisocial behavior. That just happens to be one of the things that's associated with it. But if we're understanding the disorder, we're understanding it as an emotional disorder. And the reason why we can then, if that's, you know, assuming this is right, I mean, it could be that the actual position is wrong, but assuming it's right, that's, as far as I'm concerned, extremely good news because we have such great treatments for other emotional disorders. So we can, you know, normally emotional disorders, when we think of emotional disorders, we think of people who are too, remo too responsive to emotional stimuli rather than under-responsive to emotional stimuli. But the fact is we have a large number of um, things that can help individuals to become less responsive. And so, therefore, we have the implication that there are a large number of things, the agonist for an antagonist, um, um, a different type of cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy that would help people be more responsive to um, um, uh, uh, more emotionally responsive. And so, yes, now I'm, I'm very hopeful that in, 
a, a reasonable time, we will be able to help these individuals. One of the reasons for working with the children is because the emotional disorder is much more salient and the antisocial behaviour is much less salient because of the, you know, the types of stuff they've done. So again, the opportunity potentially to have treatment strategies or at least you know, um, you know, something that will allow them to have a much richer emotional experience and therefore feel attachments, more likely to feel attachments to significant others, more likely to feel... Because um, actually, you know, there was the question about sadism. One of the issues is, is they're actually a bit less responsive to rewarding stuff in this disorder. So allow them to have the full experience of rewarding stuff as well as to have the full unpleasantness of um, um, the feeling of harm to other individuals and other sorts of aversive stimuli. So, yeah, that's for me, is the implication. Obviously, and, uh, but, you know, it, A, the position could be wrong, and B, it may not be as easy as, you know, we obviously hope, but that, I think, is the implication. Thank you. Terry, would you like to add something to this? Uh, only to say that uh, I think the longitudinal research of the type that I do is already making uh, a difference in terms of preventing antisocial behavior and crime because it's pointed to how very young, how very early in life these kinds of problems do emerge. And I think it, when I entered the field, it used to be uh, thought that um, uh, people suddenly became antisocial as adults and that you put them in prison was the thing that you do. But what we see now is what Faye mentioned at the very beginning is that the horse is way out of the barn by the time someone is old enough to go to prison. And you could prevent a lot of human suffering uh, and a lot of victimization if, the, if our sights were set on improving uh, childhood and the experience of childhood. So there has been a huge shift in the way that society uh, views the origins of antisocial behavior now, and there is a real focus of government, of education, of parenting training uh, classes on that early childhood period. And it fits in a way with the um, literary approach to the antisocial mind. I think in both your books and your books, uh, when I've read uh, where the novelist lets us inside of the mind of the antisocial character, a lot of what the character does is reminisce about their childhood and the things that went wrong from the earliest moments they can remember. And so in some ways the research is, is following along behind the literature and only just starting to catch up. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much. This has been a really exciting evening of discussion, and I, will, I want to leave you with, with a last great painting, this time by Delacroix, and it's about liberty uh, on the barricades. And we have really explored this topic of violence, of aggression, antisocial behavior in a way that at some moments we really were quite chilling. We did get to some very dark points. And I really also want to say that perhaps sometimes this propensity of humans to be violent and uh, has perhaps uh, some other purpose as here for uh, against the oppression by tyrants. It is really liberty, although it is, again, very shocking to watch this picture, to see how liberty can go across all these heaps of bodies in, in, a, in a very terrible way. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to leave um, this discussion in this way not too much on the dark side, if that's possible. Also, I did ask the question, are human beings good? Are they bad? We, we, we should perhaps say they, they are both, uh, rather than answering uh, only one way or another. But thank you all very much for your very interesting questions, and thank you, panelists, for answering. <laughs> for your but I guess just one word before you go. Um, on behalf of the Royal Society, I would like to um, pass our thanks to the Royal Society of Literature for co-organising this event and for helping us to put together this most excellent panel. Uh, Lewis referred to reciprocal altruism. If this wasn't an example of reciprocal altruism, then I don't know what is. And it occurs to me that Royal Society could greatly benefit by having people from your society join us because I've seen much more examples of bad behaviour on our committee solely 
man by scientists than I've ever thought was possible. So here <laughs> is an example for us to follow. Thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>